Welcome back. In this series of videos, I'll be covering Australia's most well-known female serial killers. Thankfully, the list of recorded cases is not long in comparison to their male counterparts, but some are guilty of the most heinous type of murder, that of babies. Unthinkable when we view women as maternal nurturers. It's also interesting to note that as serial killers, their victims are almost always known or related to them. Unlike male serial killers who seek their prey away from home and family. Recorded cases date as far back as the 1800s with poison the primary weapon of choice. Let's begin. Although the victims in the first case were all adults, they were also part of the killer's own family, making their slow and painful deaths even more cruel. Carolyn Grills was a short, dumpy woman with thick rimmed glasses and a love of baking for her family. Affectionately known as Auntie Carrie, the great grandmother would make steaming pots of tea to serve with her homemade cakes and biscuits. And when she visited her relatives, she'd arrive laden with her famous delicious treats. Auntie Carrie was always bustling about, ready to offer help when needed. When her stepmother, Christina, fell ill, kindly Auntie Carrie was on hand to care for her. Sadly, soon after, Christina passed away, aged 87. The family would soon suffer another loss when Angelina, a relation of Auntie Carrie's husband, died aged 84. Then Carrie's husband's brother-in-law, John, became ill and he too eventually died. A year later, Auntie Carrie's sister-in-law, Mary Ann, passed away at just 60. Auntie Carrie would often visit John's widow, Evelyn, making her endless cups of tea. But then Evelyn too fell ill. She lost her hair and her speech and started to go blind. The more tea she drank, the worse she felt. Evelyn's daughter, Christine, and son-in-law, John, who lived with her, began to suffer the same symptoms. But strangely, when Auntie Carrie didn't visit, they seemed to improve. It was 1952, and Sydney was in the middle of a housing crisis. Whole families were jammed into tiny rooms, and along with the people, came an infestation of large rats. There were horrific stories of rodents spotting the faces of sleeping children, and the advice was to be liberal with highly toxic rat poison. The most common was Thal rat. Available to buy over the counter, thallium salts were colourless, flavourless, odourless, and fatal. Undetectable, the poison became the murder weapon of choice. It worked by attacking several different systems at once, causing loss of hair and speech, sickness and then death. Evelyn's son-in-law, John, was reading a newspaper article on the dangers of thallium and was struck by the familiarity of the symptoms. For the first time, he began to realise that he and his wife only started to recover from their persistent illness when Auntie Carrie couldn't visit. While he wanted to brush the thought aside as coincidence, he remained suspicious. On Auntie Carrie's next visit, he watched her closely. As she was carrying a cup of tea to Evelyn, he spied her taking something from her pocket and dropping it into the teacup. John quickly slipped into the kitchen and poured the tea into a jar. He took it to the police with his concerns, who sent it for testing. Shockingly, it contained a lethal dose of thallium. Could Auntie Carrie really be a serial killer? Officers found traces of thallium in the pocket of the dress she'd been wearing. 
Other potential victims had been cremated and could not be tested for the poison. But at an inquest, witnesses were called Auntie Carrie bringing them drinks and how eager she was to help prepare food and tea. The coroner found Auntie Carrie responsible for several deaths. In May 1953, she was arrested and charged with four counts of murder and three of attempted murder on Evelyn, her daughter Christine and son-in-law John. While police believed there was a strong circumstantial case to convict her, they only proceeded with the charge of attempting to murder Evelyn. That October, Carolyn Grill, 63, appeared at the Central Criminal Court and pleaded not guilty. With no apparent motive and having nothing to gain from the deaths, Crown Prosecutor Mick Rooney, QC, alleged Carolyn was a killer who poisoned for sport, for the kick she got out of it, the thrill that she alone knew the cause of the victim's suffering. Maintaining her innocence throughout, Auntie Carrie claimed detectives pressured her relations to testify against her. During the trial, she smiled constantly, even bursting into fits of laughter. Their behaviour earned her the reputation of being heartless and malevolent. Once all the evidence had been heard, the jury took just 12 minutes to find her guilty. Auntie Carrie declared, I live to help, not to kill. Carolyn Grills was handed the death sentence and soon afterward, Thallium was banned from sale. On appeal, her death sentence was later commuted to life in prison. In Long Bay Jail, she acted as a maternal figure to the other inmates. There, Auntie Carrie became affectionately known as Aunt Thally after the type of poison she'd used. In 1960, she was rushed to hospital and died of a ruptured ulcer, taking the motive for her cruel murders to her grave. Thomas Morris resided in Victoria before moving his family to Adelaide in South Australia. His then wife, Sarah Morris, described the marriage as unhappy and also stated that her husband kept a mistress. The family moved to Western Australia for a fresh start, but it wasn't to be. When Sarah eventually left the home, the mistress, Martha Rendell, immediately moved in. Martha had followed the family from Adelaide to Western Australia and now had Sarah's five children calling her mother. She was known to have a mean, vicious streak and would often lose her temper and beat the children, once beating seven-year-old Annie so savagely that the child could not walk. Arresting officer Inspector Harry Mann would later say that Rendell delighted in seeing her victims writhe in agony and sickeningly she derived sexual satisfaction from it. In fact, little Annie would become her first victim. Rendell put something in the child's food that resulted in causing a sore throat. She then swabbed the back of Annie's throat with hydrochloric acid, claiming it was medicine. This inflamed the throat further until the child could no longer eat and starved to death. Annie died on the 28th of July, 1907. Dr Cuthbert issued a certificate stating the cause of death was diphtheria. In October the same year, Rendell then turned her attention to Olive, aged five. Using the same cruel method, Olive starved and died on the 6th of October, 1907. Again, Dr Cuthbert issued a certificate stating the cause of death was diphtheria. In the winter of 1908, Rendell tried the same method on Arthur, the third son and the youngest child still alive. Arthur, who was 14, took longer to succumb to the treatment, but eventually died on the 6th of October 1908. 
This time, Dr Cuthbert asked permission for an autopsy. Rendell insisted on being present during the investigation. She stood by as the autopsy was performed, but the doctors found nothing to incriminate her. The following year, in April 1909, Rendell then focused on the second son, George. It didn't take long for him to complain of a sore throat after drinking a cup of tea. Rendell coated his tonsils with the syrup. Having watched four of his siblings suffer and die in the same manner, the frightened boy ran to his mother, who was living some streets away. When neighbours inquired as to the boy's whereabouts, his father, Thomas, stated that he did not know. Neighbours soon became suspicious and went to the police. One neighbour claimed he had peeked in the window to see Rendell standing in front of a screaming child, rocking back and forth as if in ecstasy. Some also claimed to have witnessed her masturbating. Inspector Harry Mann conducted inquiries. He heard repeated references to the children having their throats painted and Rendell's apparent indifference to their pain. Inspector Mann located young George, who claimed that he ran away because his stepmother had killed his siblings and was trying to poison him with spirits of salts, also known as hydrochloric acid. The inquiry was hampered by the period of time that had elapsed since the deaths, and because doctors could not say what effect swabbing the throat with spirits of salts would have. Suspicions were further aroused when it was shown that Rendell had purchased large quantities of spirits of salts during the period of the children's illnesses, but none since the last death. Armed with this information, detectives obtained permission to exhume the bodies, and this was done on the 3rd of July, 1909. Post-mortems of the three children found diluted hydrochloric acid on their throat tissue. Rendell and Thomas Morris were both charged with murder, Rendell being sentenced to death by hanging. She protested her innocence, maintaining that she was treating the children for diphtheria. Thomas Morris was later acquitted. It was believed that, although he had purchased spirits of salts, he was not aware of the crimes until after the children's deaths. The jury wanted to find him guilty of being an accessory after the fact, but it was not allowed. Rendell's crimes aroused considerable public outrage at the time. The press portrayed her as a scarlet woman and a wicked stepmother. She was hanged at Fremantle Prison on the 6th of October 1909 and is buried at Fremantle Cemetery. Half a century later, Western Australia's infamous serial killer, Eric Cook, was hanged for his crimes and his body placed above Rendell's in the same unmarked grave. Martha Rendell was the last woman executed in the state of Western Australia. Frances Knorr was born as Minnie Thwaites in London, England, on the 10th of December, 1868. She emigrated to Sydney in the colony of New South Wales in 1887. Initially, she worked as a domestic servant until she married Rudolf Knorr, a German immigrant. They were blessed with the birth of a daughter, Gladys, in 1892, but things soon turned sour when Rudolf was sent to prison in Adelaide for selling furniture on hire purchase there. In 1892, Australia was in the midst of a depression and it was difficult for a lone woman with a child to make ends meet. Frances turned her hand to dressmaking but failed. Finding herself almost destitute, she stole some money and made her way to Melbourne. There, she took up with a man named Edward Thompson, a fishmonger's assistant, but the affair was short-lived. Frances moved again and found her way into the business of baby farming. 
Baby farming was open to any woman with a child or children of her own. She could get away with claiming to be a nurse and could take babies in on a long-term basis. The mother, usually with an illegitimate child, would pay an initial down payment of up to £20 and then make smaller monthly payments. In return, the baby would be cared for and she could visit at pre-arranged times. Often, the mother would arrive for a visit only to find that the baby farmer had vanished, her child sold to a childless couple at an exorbitant cost. The baby farmer would normally change their name and set up business in another town or state. Given that this was now Frances's choice of income, she moved around a lot, using variations of her known names. There were many mothers hunting Frances down, wanting to find their missing babies. The mothers did not report the babies as missing, frightened at being exposed as a single mother with an illegitimate child. Rudolph was released from prison and reunited with Frances. They moved back to Sydney. A tenant in one of her old residences was gardening and found the decomposing remains of a baby girl. She still had a length of rope around her neck. When police arrived at the scene, neighbours let them know that the previous tenant, Frances, had also lived in another nearby house. That garden was also upturned and the remains of two baby boys were found. An autopsy discovered that the cause of death for the girl was strangulation and both the boys were suffocated. The neck of one of the little boys had been compressed to less than half its normal size. It was during the birth of his second child that police came to arrest Francis for murder. They had to wait for the child to be born before they escorted Francis back to Melbourne. During the inquest, 33 witnesses were called and their evidence was damning. One witness stated that Frances Knorr had uncountable dealings with unwed mothers and the swapping and re-farming of babies was so large in numbers it was hard to keep track of. Frances was charged with three counts of murder, but even with the mountain of evidence against her, she pleaded her innocence denying she'd murdered and buried the babies. The news tightened when a letter from Frances to her ex-lover, Edward Thompson, was intercepted by police. In the letter, Frances asked Edward to falsify evidence and have him blamed for the burials. She asked him to testify that the children were theirs, not those of unwed mothers, and that the babies had died of consumption. If this was to be her saving grace, it failed miserably. After a five-day trial, a guilty verdict was delivered. Judge Holroyd passed the mandatory death sentence. Frances, still in denial, screamed from the dock, God forgive you and your sins, Ted, meaning Edward Thompson. God help my poor mother. God help my poor babies. She collapsed and had to be carried out of the chamber and transported to Old Melbourne Jail to wait execution. Thomas Jones was to be Francis Knorr's hangman. With public divide over the execution of women, there was tension in the Jones household. Newspapers of the time provided scathing details of the baby murderer, yet the public knew how hard it was for lone women with children to survive. The hangman's wife was outraged that her husband was to be employed to hang Francis, so outraged that she threatened to leave him if he went through with it. That and the public pressure became too much and Thomas suicided two days before the execution date. The execution had to be postponed and a replacement found. It was rescheduled for Monday, January 15th, 1894. On the day before her execution, Frances made a written confession, part of which was made public the day after her execution. It read in part, Placed as I am now within a few hours of my death, 
I express a strong desire that this statement be made public with the hope that my fall will not only be a warning to others, but also act as a deterrent to those who are perhaps carrying on the same practice. I now desire to state that upon the two charges known in evidence as number one and number two babies, I confess to be guilty. Francis Knorr was hanged at the old Melbourne jail at 10 a.m. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for the next in this series or for many of the murder, mystery and mayhem videos. Until next time.